Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Culture Plus Giving Thanks, the November installment of the Norton Center's Culture Plus series. My name is Steve Hoffman, and I'm the Executive Director of Center College's Norton Center for the Arts. We are honored to have partnered with some incredible Kentucky artists and thought leaders to share their stories and ideas and art related to Thanksgiving from a Native American perspective. So thank you for joining us. I hope that you'll appreciate the stories you hear, enjoy the art presented, and think about Thanksgiving next week and in the future with a new perspective. Tonight, we're also uh, thankful for our program partners, the Kentucky Arts Council, the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission, and the Art Center of the Bluegrass. At this time, I would like to ask Mark Brown as a representative of the Kentucky Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet and the Kentucky Arts Council's Folk and Traditional Arts Director to say a few words. Mark? Thanks very much, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, I work for the Kentucky Arts Council, which is um, part of the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage C Cabinet. We have a mission to foster environments for all Kentuckians to value, benefit from, and participate in the arts. So we're very excited to co-sponsor tonight's episode of Culture Plus. Um, and since we're all about giving thanks tonight, um, I'd like to say I'm thankful for uh, Tressa Brown, who's the coordinator of the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission, and her colleague, Helen Danzer, who's on the call tonight, um, for their help and partnership um, in planning and presenting the traveling exhibit, Native Reflections, Visual Art by American Indians of Kentucky. Um, also thankful for the Kentucky Heritage Council, which is our partner and sister agency under the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet, um, also for making the exhibit possible. Um, thankful for the Art Center of the Bluegrass for hosting the Native Reflections exhibit this month and next in their wonderful facility there in Danville. Um, I'm thankful for the artists tonight, Bridget Truex and Fred Nez Keems and Martha Redbone uh, for sharing their thoughts and stories and, and art. Um, and finally, thankful for Steve Hoffman and his excellent staff there at the Norton Center uh, for putting together all these pieces and, um, and welcoming everyone to tonight's presentation. So now I look forward to uh, listening and learning with all of you. Thanks again, Steve. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Immediately following the discussion, we will launch our Culture Plus Encore program featuring Kentucky native and friend Martha Redbone. Martha gave an absolutely incredible concert at the Norton Center in 2018, and the audience was adamant that we bring her back, so we did. She will share some traditional and original music and stories in this very intimate Zoom setting, and there'll be nothing you need to do except wait a moment as we launch into the Zoom Encore. The Culture Plus series is part of the Norton Center's Creative Conversations program, which is supported by an endowed gift by 1995 Center College graduate, Dr. Jeff Johnson and Ken Michael. Now I'd like to introduce you to Molly Brown, the Norton Center Engagement Services Manager. Before she provides some preliminary details you will need for this evening's program, Molly will share with us a land acknowledgement. Molly? Thanks, Steve, um, and thanks everyone for being here. We're, we're so glad that you came. Today, the Norton Center at Center College sits on the ancestral lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Yuchi, Adena, and Hopewell Nations. According to the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission's review of the 2010 United States Census, over 170 American Indian tribes are represented by members who live and work in the Commonwealth. This is in addition to many others of indigenous descent not represented in the census data. We would like to take this moment to remember those who have been forcibly displaced from their territories. And we ask you to join us in acknowledging that indigenous culture is a living culture that thrives across the region and the continent at large. Here at the Norton Center, we strive to be a space where people can appreciate the arts and the stories that artists tell through their craft. So when we leave here today, we encourage you to seek out opportunities to engage with the work of contemporary Native American artists and to explore how to support their creative efforts. For resources that can help get you started, please visit our website. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And so moving on from that, I just want to go over a couple of logistic things so that we can enjoy the program together tonight. Um, first, I want to let you know that you have two viewing options. At the top of your screen, you can select to use the presenter view, which will highlight the video feed of the person who's speaking. Um, you could also choose to do the gallery view, which will give you um, a view of a lot of different windows, but the speakers will all be on the first page and you can cycle through pages if you wish. I also want to take an opportunity to thank Karen Schultz, who is our ASL interpreter for the evening. If her services will be useful to you, please make sure that you select her window and spotlight her feed um, so that she'll be highlighted on your page. I also want to mention that even though the audience will remain muted throughout the entire program, we will have a Q&A session at the end of tonight's event. So if you'd like to ask a question to one of our panelists, simply type in the chat box and direct your question to Matt Overing. Matt will then field our quest, the questions that you come up with to um, Tara Strauch, our moderator, who will then field them to the panelists. Um, we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions, mm -hmm. but if for some reason we can't um, get to everyone's, we'll do our best to see if the panelists um, would be able to answer them and we could follow up with you. Um, so unless I've forgotten anything, Steve, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Molly. And thanks to the entire Norton Center staff for making this program happen and for all of the hard work our team is providing to get us prepared to have in-person programs again sometime soon. Now it is with great pleasure that I introduce Center College's president, Dr. Milton Moreland, to share a few words. Welcome, President Moreland. Thank you, Steve. Good to see all of you. Thank you, Mark and Molly. I am so happy to be part of this program, welcoming you to the Norton Center tonight, welcoming you to another incredible program at Center College. We are delighted that even during a world pandemic, this creative staff, these wonderful human beings at the Norton Center have figured out ways to keep us engaged, to give us some opportunities to not just think about the world pandemic, but to think about other important topics in the arts and in culture. So thank you, Steve Hoffman, for your leadership. Now I am so pleased to introduce one of our fantastic faculty members at Center who will be moderating the program and introducing our speakers and guests tonight. Dr. Tara Strauch is Assistant Professor of History at Center. She is a professor of early American history and researches at the intersection of religion and politics and culture. She is especially focused in her research on rituals and holidays, and actually right now is finishing a book on American holidays, the history of those holidays. So, We'll look forward to that in the future, but uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Strzok to the program. She's very interested in our holiday traditions and how appropriate to uh, have her leading this conversation tonight. Welcome to everybody. Looking forward to this program. Thank you very much, President Moreland. I'm <coughs> so excited to be here tonight. Um, as President Moreland said, um, holidays are something I'm really passionate about. And in particular, I'm passionate about people taking ownership of their holidays um, and not feeling like holidays happen to them, but instead making them into the celebrations they want them to be, or if they don't want them to be doing that too. Um, and so I'm really excited to have a, an evening tonight where we think critically um, about what we celebrate and why we celebrate it, um, while we also get to um, listen to music um, and enjoy culture and art through um, flutes and poems. Um, I, I'm really excited. So let me um, introduce our panelist to you. Um, and I'm not gonna go in any particular order. Um, we have um, Helen Dancer, who is the chair, the chair of the Kentucky Native American Heritage Commission. Um, and Helen brings passion um, for, for 
teaching people um, about indigenous culture and about their presence here in Kentucky. So welcome, Helen. Thank you, Tara. It's a pleasure for me to be here this evening. And I hope that uh, we will bring something that is new and exciting and educational to the program. As Tara said, I'm chair of the Kentucky Native Her American Heritage Commission. This has given me a platform to work with the indigenous people in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I grew up knowing that I was Indian all my life, but there was no, to no way to express that. Um, I was in that generation where the parents said, you do not talk about such things. And it took a long time for me to find indigenous people in the Commonwealth. I even went to Navajo country out in Arizona to try to find American Indian people with whom I could relate. So the commission has been a real blessing to me. The commission uh, works to educate, preserve, and to keep alive what we can of the culture. We have a number of American Indians in the Commonwealth, as Tara had indicated. I was asked uh, how, many, uh, how many organizations do we have? And in the last 10 years, we have been unable to actually determine exactly how many uh, organizations we do have. I am aware of an organization in Northeastern Kentucky that I get glimmers of maybe once ever four or five years and then I hear nothing from them again. I know that there are organizations in southeastern Kentucky. I know there's one in, well, there's one in Corbin. Actually, they're both in Corbin, but southeastern Kentucky's kind of messed up in the way its uh, county lines run. So those two are reasonably quiet, don't participate. There's one in Clay County, right next door to me in Jackson County. Uh, he's a commissioner. There are organizations in Louisville. I belong to the indigenous people of Kentucky and uh, that organization is headquartered in Louisville, but we're scattered throughout the Commonwealth in Southern Indiana. And our goal is to try to bring the indigenous in Kentucky together. And we're, we're doing this one person at a time. Um, hopefully in the near future, we will be able to broaden that and have more come together because it is in the togetherness that we can share our culture, share our ceremonies, share our life together because I was actually a misfit in uh, the civilization of this country until I was able to find and connect with indigenous people. And I'm not the only one that uh, fit that mold. I had occasion in the last uh, three months to meet an individual in Richmond who, uh, who let me know very early on, I'm lost. I know I have ancestry. I don't know what to do with it. I, d I don't know how to live. And through conversations and uh, time together, uh, this individual now is wanting to, join, wanting to join Kentucky's indigenous people and has told uh, a friend of mine numerous times that he didn't know he was who he was until we met and he could speak with people of like mind. So it's a pleasure to be here and to represent the commission and the indigenous of this Commonwealth. And I look forward to hearing from the other artists here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. Um, I'll introduce the other our artists um, together so that we have plenty of time then um, for us to talk and listen and enjoy. Um, so we have Martha Redbone, we're so excited. Um, she is amongst many other things, a vocalist, a songwriter, a composer, and an educator. Um, her music is genre bending um, and brings together um, kind of the, the sound of um, Harlan County, Kentucky, along with um, the electric grit of pre-gentrified Brooklyn. Um, she's been at the Norton Center with us before and we're so pleased to have her with us today. We also have um, Bridget Truex. 
Um, and Bridget is coming to us um, both as a poet, um, as a dancer, um, and as an artist. She brought us the gorgeous artwork um, that you saw when you registered for this event. Um, it's an inspirational piece. And if you're local, I really encourage you to go to the Art Center for the Bluegrass to visit um, with it. I, I got the opportunity to do it and it was a great experience. And then finally, we have um, Fred Keems, who is going to join us as well. Fred, um, amongst his many accomplishments, makes flutes and performs um, in various genres. And we are thrilled to have him with us as well. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes um, to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my fellow um, panelists and hear a little bit about their experiences, both with the holiday um, and in their communities. And what I wanna do just really quickly is to sort of suggest some of the ways that the holiday might have developed differently than you think. Um, so the story is that the first Thanksgiving happens um, in Plymouth Rock. Um, in 1621. Um, and I think Bridget will get to talk to us a little bit later about being and living in and around that place and what that's like. But early American historians like to make a joke um, that it's actually at least the third Thanksgiving that happens in the New World. Uh, we know that Thanksgivings happened in Jamestown in 1607 and in Santa Fe in 1598. And we're sure that they happened in other times and places as well, because Thanksgivings were one of the most common holidays or kind of religious and political events um, for early modern European people. Whether they were Catholic or Protestant, whether they were in the old world or in the new world, stopping and giving thanks to God um, for their successes and their blessings was incredibly important to them. And in most communities, this was balanced. Um, Thanksgiving tended to happen in the fall, and they balanced this in the spring with a day of fasting where they prayed to God to, to ask forgiveness for their sins. So I think it's really important to understand that when the Puritans, um, when the, the pilgrims come to Plymouth Rock, they're not doing something new or special. And in fact, they're doing something really, really normal for them. So when we think about the holiday, um, for the first 200 years of American history, North American history, when people celebrated Thanksgivings, they weren't remembering the events at 1621. Instead, they were celebrating their communities um, and their connection with people around them and with God. By the 19th century, however, um, particularly in New England, they did start to think about this as a day for celebrating the pilgrims. But this was not a nationwide holiday. Lots of places had Thanksgivings, but it wasn't something that they did as a nation. It's not until Abraham Lincoln in 1863 um, that we see Thanksgiving being made a national event. And he's using it to try to draw Americans together. This is one of the themes of Thanksgiving. Sometimes um, it's bringing people together and sometimes it's pushing them apart. In 1863, he calls for a Thanksgiving to try to join together the fractured parts of the North. But in doing so, he makes it harder for the South to come back and rejoin the nation because Thanksgiving was celebrating um, kind of Northern victories and Southerners felt offended, um, so white Southerners felt offended when they came back into the nation after 1865 and felt that this new holiday um, celebrating the North was being thrust upon them. So the holiday unites and it divides. We see this continuing in the 20th century with the advent of Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in 1924 um, and Black Friday shopping, which actually happens pretty early, we start to see some people who think it's not being celebrated correctly. In 1939, President Roosevelt tried to change the date of Thanksgiving. He moved it backward or forward, no, backward. He tried to make the, the shopping period longer between Thanksgiving and Christmas in order to encourage people to buy things. This made Americans so angry that it was often called Franksgiving instead of Thanksgiving. He never tried again. In 1970, a group of Native Americans came together um, and celebrated the first day of mourning on Thanksgiving, a day of remembering the losses um, that had occurred at the hands of the United States government and the hand of American culture. And I'm really excited to have Bridget tell us about that in a little bit. 
the holiday divides and the holiday brings together. Another part of the holiday, and this is my last bit, um, that I think is important to mention is it's always been about action. When the pilgrims and when other early Europeans came together to celebrate thanks, they were doing something as a community. Um, and that continued to be important. Um, giving to charitable groups was important from an early period, as was dancing and fireworks and eating and food. The food tradition in particular has been both consistent and diverse. If you're from the South, you probably eat cornbread stuffing. If you're from the North, you probably eat breadcrumb stuffing. Um, if you're in the South, you might have mashed sweet potatoes. But if you're, you're in the North, you're less likely to do that. Um, so I'm really excited to talk now with the panelists and think about how Thanksgiving has brought people together and divided them and what kind of holiday they celebrate or they would like to celebrate. So I'm going to turn to Martha now. Um, I think, let me double check myself. Um, I got too excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am, I am gonna turn to Martha next. So Martha, um, I would like to kind of continue on this theme of thinking about thanks as an action and turn to you first, although all the panelists are welcome to join in. Um, how do you think that making art can kind of connect you to community or help you give thanks? Well, greetings, everyone. Um, back home, we say, Ocio, everyone. Um, uh, it's lovely to be here. It's an honor to uh, share this panel discussion. Um, I, uh, I have so many mixed feelings about this because of how I was raised. I'm from Harlan County. And, um, and I was raised by my grandparents, who my, my grandma's Cherokee, Shawnee, and white mixture, and my grandpa's Choctaw, and African American, and uh, Alabama Cushada, too, from down the bayou. So um, I was raised in a very traditional household. And in our coal mining town, um, there are three, we're kind of the three remaining uh, Cherokee families in, in the region. My, my grandma's been there since time immemorial. And um, we, were the, we were the families who came back from the Trail of Tears. So we went to Tahlequah and enrolled and then our family came back. And, um, and we'd always wondered that because well, from that time we lost our Indian status with, um, you know, the, the reclassifications and all the historical things, uh, the, these acts that have come in to kind of erase us on paper, you know. And so, um, so I, I was inspired to write about my family story and, and we put it into a song cycle and a kind of play. Um, that talks about the history of our connection, our family connection to the land and how we continue to be here. So um, that also growing up with my grandparents, um, being raised by my grandparents, um, you know, it, it, Helen, Helen really um, touched my heart because um, Helen is, is from the generation that my mother was raised in. And my, my grandmother did exactly the same thing to my mom and my aunt. This was something being being indigenous was something that you didn't really talk about because it didn't really help. Um, they wanted us to, you know, wanted my parents' generation to assimilate, and so um, you know to move away from the culture. You won't need your language. You don't need that culture. You don't need all of that. You know, just you know, study and get good jobs so that you can you know, earn a living and have your families. And so a lot of that was removed, but you know, my mom's heyday was in the sixties and seventies. And so that was the reclamation of culture and uh, the, the kind of um, rejuvenation for our Eastern Woodlands peoples of uh, cultural preservation and, and, um, and reclaiming uh, who we are and reclaiming ourselves as indigenous people and uh, learning as much as we could relearn that had been taken away from us. And with that um, came the language and the songs that, you know, that I would, that I've come to learn and the lullabies and, and things like that. And so um, now that I'm a mom myself, it's really important that I, that my son knows it so that he can teach it to his, 
his children when he's grown. And so um, that led me into a kind of organic um, journey of, of um, education and um, cultural preservation through music. As a musician, I, I sing and, and um, you know, everybody loves music. I don't know anybody who doesn't love music in some, some way. And so um, to be able to share that with young people and to talk about this this land and, and our beautiful state of Kentucky. Um, it's beautiful and controversial at the same time. And with me living in New York City, you can imagine, you know, the being torn between so many different things and always being something always calls us back to home. But I did really feel that it's very important that people understand the importance of um, the Cherokee Shawnee story in Black Mountain and in the state of Kentucky. I can't tell you how many other uh, Native American uh, people from other uh, regions um, kind of write off the state of Kentucky and they said there's no there's no Indians in Kentucky there's no natives there there's no there's no reservations there and there's you know we're kind of written off as you know especially when you you know I've had every single joke you know with the the great 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 grandmother being a Cherokee princess I see you laughing over there Fred <laughs> <laughs> but you know we've all heard that along the road and um so we've had every joke you know like that so um our east our eastern woodlands people have you know we're, we have real thick skins to um to be able to uh stand up for our who we are and our and the story of our culture because we had a lot everything taken away um and we've had to uh, claw it back and so, um, and we're really proud of that struggle because that is a testament to our resilience, despite what um, federal governments and things like that and, and laws being put in place, you can't take away people's um, histories and, and indigenous people, our histories are oral traditions. So these are passed down. Um, and so that's created the urgency for me to continue my uh, journey um, in cultural preservation through music. I hear a story of erasure and reclamation there that I think is really fascinating. I'd love to hear the other panelists if they have um, a similar sort of narrative there. I think it's important to think about when we think about Thanksgiving, um, how are we helping reclaim that story and that history? And how can we, um, even us very white Americans um, at, our, at our Thanksgiving celebrations, how can we help that process? Helen, did you have some thoughts about that? Yes, Tara, I, I, I do. Um, I really appreciate what uh, Martha said there because um, reclamation is uh, what all of us in the Commonwealth are trying to do is to reclaim our heritage, to live into who we are and who we were meant to be. And I agree with her wholeheartedly in the uh, pushback that we get and uh, for myself, I get that pushback uh, from many different sources. Uh, it's rather subtle in the general population. Sometimes it's not quite so subtle in uh, some of the uh, Indian folk west of the Mississippi because I have been in some of those situations where uh, I was told vehemently, there are no mountains in Kentucky. <laughs> there are no Indians in Kentucky. There never were any Indians in Kentucky. And I was actually in an all Indian school on drugs and alcohol uh, where this was being said. So finally I got the courage to ask the lady, where did you get your information? I got it at the government school. Of course, they sent us all away. So it's a hard journey to reclaim, but it's also exhilarating because as I tried to indicate earlier, I did not really feel like I belonged anywhere. Although I had all the white privilege, it didn't make me a part of the community. It did not make me a part of the cultural civilization there until I met American Indians, and it doesn't matter to me what tribe they are or where they are, but I am partial to the Eastern Woodlands because it, we lost 
we lost, uh, I think, as much as those who were put on the reservations because they had their community. We didn't. As Martha says, that they were one of about three families there. My family was totally isolated. And Helen, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Um, I want to make sure we get Fred and Bridget into this part of the conversation. And I, I just want to also mention for anyone who doesn't, so um, when we say East, Eastern Woodlands, um, we're indicating a kind of a group of um, natives um, and a link, often a linguistic group as well. Um, and I want to kick it over to Fred for a minute, um, who is not from the Eastern Woodlands, um, to tell us a little bit maybe about um, how he came to make his flutes um, and the story that they bring for him and maybe to play for us too. Uh, good evening, uh, my name is Fred and I am from uh, Wonder Rock, Arizona and I am a full-blooded Navajo and I've been here in Kentucky for 15 years and uh, how I came to Kentucky is I met my wife uh, over at the Indian Health Services. She actually came out from Kentucky to start home health out there on the reservation. Um, at the time, we didn't have home health. So she came out there to start the program and that's how we met. And after that, um, she uh, brought me this way and uh, I've been here ever since. So. Uh, Sorry, I kind of lost a little of the Navajo um, accent, I guess. So now I picked up more of a, a Kentucky accent a little bit. So, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been raised uh, on the reservation all my life. Uh, I've been to boarding school, uh, 1978 all the way to 1985, I think. And uh, that's where I was raised from the government boarding school where, uh, uh, they told us not to speak our language, and uh, they uh, took our hair. Uh, they told us not to sing our songs, but most of those little boys, uh, most of them, some of them were really, really traditional um, that were brought up. So uh, the ones that were taught us how to sing songs. So we would go into our little bunk beds and drop, you know, pull the sheets over and sing songs, and they would teach us the uh, Native American church song. And uh, that's where um, they, they kept that going in, among us. And uh, I picked up the uh, Apache Crown dance when I was in the uh, boarding school. Um, there was a, a dorm uh, supervisor there or one of the residents. Uh, he was Apache, so he thought it'd be nice to teach these little Navajo boys the Apache Crown dance. So, uh, so I became a crown dancer. And which is um, the uh, part of the Apache culture. But at one time, the Apache, Apaches and the Navajos were together and the language, uh, I can understand what they're saying. And they speak very fast and it seems more like they cut the Navajo language in half, but I can understand what they're saying. Uh, as I got out of the boarding school, um, I picked up more of the language uh, from my uh, parents and uncle, aunts, grandmas, grandpas, and uh, it just, for some reason, when they were talking in Navajo, I would understand without even knowing what they were saying. I knew, I understood, so uh, they told me it was in the blood, so that, I thought, okay, so ever since then, but, um, but I was kind of raised by my grandparents, um, uh, that's how you say grandparents in Navajo, um, my uh, grandmother uh, gave me a Navajo name uh, it's called Bebat. Uh, Bebat means, in a way, it's called Baha. It's like a little sheet that, you know, um, like when the little lamb is born and you touch it with your hand and then you put your scent on it and then the mother doesn't want it. Uh, so I was always following my grandma around. So that's how my grandma named me Bebat. And that's kind of like the Navajo name. And my grandparents are medicine men and a, a very traditional Native American church. So um, I went to see my grandmother um, a couple of years ago and 
at that time, uh, um, she, she's a medicine man, a medicine woman. So she went into her medicine box and she gave me her feather. This is her, this is her uh, eagle feather that she did a lot of ceremonies with and she passed it on. This was her uncle's. And my grandfather, my grandmother is 97 and my grandfather just passed away uh, two years ago and he was a uh, hundred. And uh, so this was passed down to me and what she told me was Didi Nigo, Didi Nigo, Didi Nigo Sin Case means like you know what to do with it, you help others with it. So this feather is um, passed down to me. So now I'm going to pass it down to my kids. Uh, hopefully uh, they do the right thing with it. So, um, and I got my medicine box here. So, and as far as, uh, uh, like for us being Native American, Native American month, we do that every day. You know, we don't have to wear regalia or put feathers or whatever. You know, we are Native American every day and we, uh, we go to church every day. You know, we have our, um, our sweet grass, we burn it every morning and we have our little medicine pouch that we, uh, give thanks and we say our prayers every morning and every night before we go to bed. We pray for all, especially uh, with this COVID going on. And um, I just lost a cousin from the COVID this past weekend. And uh, the Navajo Nation is very, is hit very hard with the COVID and they're on lockdown. So um, it's very different living out on the reservation where there's nothing. And Thanksgiving, like you said, uh, it brings us together as family. But for us, we really don't sit at a table and eat like a feast and stuff. But we actually go to church. We bring the teepee in. We sing our prayers and say, uh, sing our songs and give thanks and help others. So that's uh, our way of Thanksgiving is bringing the family together in, in a spiritual way. And uh, as far as flute making, I... Um, it's always been with me ever since I was small. Uh, my mother passed away when I was like 20 something. I, I lost track now. And I fell into depression and uh, I actually moved into the city where my cousin was and I was sitting at the porch and all of a sudden I heard this beautiful sound and uh, it just hit, it just hit me deep down inside and it just stayed with me. And uh, Next you know, it was the Native American flute. And uh, at the time I couldn't get one because there was nobody made it and it was very expensive. Um, uh, it was like three, $400 back in the day and now it goes up. But, um, so I decided to make the flute myself. <clears throat> and there was a lot of trials and error. And when I got it and I told, um, I told myself that, you know, I'm just going to have one set price and everybody should have a flute. And it doesn't matter where you play or who you play for. It, it will always touch someone out there going through a hard time. And uh, it brings a lot of people together. So you should have. But well, thank you very much for having me and very honored. Will you play for us? Yes. This is a flute that I made. Uh, this flute... Uh, when I started making flutes, uh, my mentor, his name is Roger, he's from Oregon, and he's non-native, but he started making flutes. So I really fell in love with his flutes, and in a way, he uh, taught me over the phone at the same time from Oregon. So, but I was doing the work. And this is the flute that I almost threw away, and uh, he told me not to throw away the flutes that I make. He said, put it aside, and... Uh, later on, when you come back, you know what you did wrong. So this flute sat in the, you know, back to the fire flute. But, um, I took it out one day, and this is a flute I always play now. Thank you. 
minor uh, uh, pentatonic scale. And back in the day, this back in the day, uh, the flute was almost lost, and it had a the older flutes had a different sound. And I'm gonna play this flute. This flute was given to me, and this is the Comanche flute. It's very light, very thin. Uh, it's almost like a straw, and it has a unique sound to it. It's called a warble. And it's not tuned to any scale. Fred, we kind of, Fred, we kind of lost your your sound there a little bit. Could right. you try one more? Um, can you try one more time to talk? Oh, you can you hear me now. Okay, so you want me to play it real quick again? Um, oh, well, oh, let's no. let Bridget Bridget come in for a little bit, and then we'll bring okay. back to you. But I didn't know that something so beautiful could come through my computer that lovely. I thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> it was You're welcome. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, let me turn to Bridget now. We haven't gotten to hear from her yet. And I I'm I love the the kind of symmetry, interesting symmetry all the stories so far have had um about erasure and reclamation, um, both in your personal lives, but also a little bit in your in your artwork and art forms. And Bridget, I'm hoping that you will tell us a little bit about your time um, along the Eastern Coast, um, and especially your time um, with people at the National Day of Mourning. Um, yes, um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm so pleased to be part of this group. Uh, hearing Fred, I, it just made me think or realize that I feel more of a community just with this conference. It's, it means a lot. It, it really does. Um, and when you were talking about the symmetry, I thought that's appropriate because my story growing up was very much like Helen's and um, Martha's, that I, my, my parents died when I was in my early 30s. So I was not even told anything about my native heritage at all. But how I found out was um, when I moved to California. I was living in California and I moved back to New England and that's where everything started. That was where I really uh, was very fortunate, really blessed to get involved with the Native community there. I, I had gone to a little powwow and very little one in Rhode Island and met people and it just blossomed from there. I mean, I, I just felt so welcome and doing, talking to people I, I was finding out about my heritage. I knew my grandmother had been born in a little uh, town in, in Ver northern Vermont, right near the uh, Canadian border. And we went up there and I found out more about the, the heritage. But my ancestry is, I'm Abenaki, and we're in northern Vermont and in Quebec. So before her, everybody was from Canada, from Quebec. So it's been difficult to do the research, but uh, the the feeling that you get uh, is as we've all expressed that is when you're with the with native people. There's it's it's hard to explain that you just feel you've you've found a new family, uh, an extended family, and it's been a uh, it's hard to describe how important it is, and so. 
I belong to the Kentucky indigenous people as Helen was referring to, and that's been a big help because when I moved back, I moved from California, about New England back to California and then here about seven years ago. And it's been difficult without a, uh, an, a clearly defined native community here. So I'm really grateful for Kip. Um, and as I say, just actually just hearing and seeing this conference, this, this panel has been a big help because it just brings it more to, to, to life that there are other Native people out here. And it's, it's so much a part of, of my feeling that when you don't have it, you realize there's something missing. So, but uh, speaking again, while we were, we were talking about the day of mourning, I was fortunate enough to live the little town in Massachusetts about 30 miles north of Plymouth, which was actually settled 20 years after Plymouth was. So it has a long history of, of the early settlement there. But I did go down to the uh, day of mourning and, and I wanted to point out something that I had read. I actually read this online, but I've, I've heard this too, that the first quote, day of Thanksgiving was not in uh, 1620. That's when the pilgrims got there. But according to the records that I found online, it said that it was Govern Governor John Winthrop, who was the, the governor of the colony um, in 1637, had decided to celebrate the return of the pilgrim militia who had been in Mystic, Connecticut, and actually it's referred to as the, as the Pequot Massacre. And that was the day of Thanksgiving, that when yeah, they came back. Yeah, that's the first Thanksgiving proclamation, yes. Yeah, and so yeah. they were gonna have a, a celebration that they came, that these militia came back from killing 700 of the Pequots. So it obviously does not have a good uh, feeling. And as I say, I was very fortunate to be in, in, in situ at the town that I was in when uh, they were doing the day of mourning. And so that's, the, the Thanksgiving has always been sort of a very much an ambivalent day for us because when I think about it, I, I remember the years that we'd go down, we'd go to Plymouth harbor and there's a statue of Massasoit who was the Wampanoag chief who came and welcomed the first pilgrims and we that's where we'd have the, the gathering we'd gather at the statue and do prayers and and ceremonies and then afterwards there was a a, a feast people that were at the that the statue would go back and and of course, our feasts are always a, a potluck. You bring everything and you share things. So it's, uh, and not being there any longer, it's it's difficult because as I say, I always remember that so, so well. Um, and, and one thing that Helen said, I was thinking about this, I had a t-shirt when I lived there and I've, I wish I still had it, but it, on the print of it, the front was the words, and it was referring to the, to the New England Woodlands people, the first to welcome and the last to be recognized. And that's still the case with the Abenaki, for example, we were state recognized, but haven't gotten a federal recognition. And one, just as an aside, one, one I think a, a great example of the bureaucratic thinking, the Wampanoags on Cape Cod, the federal, government recognized the, the gay head Wampanoags that are out on, on Martha's Vineyard, but not the, the, uh, the Mashpee Wampanoags. And I thought that's an interesting <laughs> distinction. They're obviously the same group, but they only recognize one of them. So I can't understand the government, but. I, there are things I will not say what I would say, but. I think recognizing some of the tribes that haven't been recognized by the federal government is incredibly important. I will just, if you give me a second, I mean, 
Um, for example, they exist all over the United States. Um, so for example, the Lumbee um, in North and right. South Carolina um, and many others, the, the, yeah, yes. Yes, I know them. <laughs> I've been down there before. My, my father, my grandfather is Lumbee. My, my dad really? is, yes, oh, my wow. dad, my dad's mom is African-American and my grandfather um, was love me from Pembroke Indian Reservation. But um, during those times, um, I can, you know, I can speak on it because I've, I've, I've lived it. During those times, um, they, there was so much changing over of everything, you know, when it came to uh, recognition and all of that and, and a lot of the Jim Crow laws that came in. And so um, they decided that, um, that your mother that the mother would determine the the race of the children and and my grandmother was black and um and yes. so that's what happened and pretty much overnight it removed they were removed from being cheros which is what uh the roles that they were on was chera and to black and that was that they were completely removed mm -hmm. and um and then my my grandpa uh died very young he was 33 um, and they think he might have had something like lupus but back in those days you know it was all tobacco fields and things like that people didn't know they were from this you know from the swamps out there and so um uh she you know my grandmother didn't work and she had five children when my grandfather passed away and um and so the lumby family they they abandoned her and the children so it was a pretty tragic story but it was a lot of the because of those kind of jim crow laws and and racial reclassification laws that were put in place in uh, the state of north carolina yeah and i mean i think one of the things as americans you should think about is the way in which um multiracial people for a very long time were were forced to choose or were forced into one Me, racial category. I'm one of them. Yeah. I'm one of them. I mean, I can't even tell you. It's so, it's so, here we are in the 21st century and the amount of um, the anti-blackness because my dad is black. Um, and so it's like you kind of fall in between the, the cracks, you know, I'm not black enough to be you know, fully embraced in the black community. And I'm not, um, and I'm too black to be considered fully native in the native community. And in the native community, there's so much anti-blackness and, and a kind of, uh, what do they call that? Uh, most people are trying to have a, to fit into the phenotypes that everyone, that we're all addicted to. So mm -hmm. as, as soon as you say that you're, you know, it's, it's sad because, you know, indigenous people, it's, you know, it's dogs, horses, and Native Americans who have to prove our yeah. our pedigree. You know, and um, and so as soon as you say that you're Native American, people say how much, and it's like, what do you mean? I, so I always say, <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, are you like a quarter? I say, I'm not a quarter. I'm a person. You know, <laughs> so you know, so there's been a lot of that, and and I think um, that's also been the kind of uh, fuel to the fire in my belly because I think that um, it's been really important to, you know, as an independent artist to really uh, follow that journey because we, I think our entire country needs to acknowledge the history that's been um, covered up and, and the knowledge is power and it is part of our story and our stories should not be erased. I mean, that's how we're here. and. Um, and so I always felt like as a performer and as an artist, if people could see me, you know, raised traditionally by my grandparents, you know, my, my grandpa came up from the Bayou tribes to, you know, to work in the coal mines and, you know, where our family had been forever. And then, you know, have this uh, African-American lineage as well and in New York City and, you know, there's like so, it's so rich and um, and very real. You know, my story is not unique at all and you know i what's so beautiful about this um group of people that we're here there's so many you know i feel like we're um in the same choir you know as we say because um it's it's important that these stories get told because each individual story has this journey has a journey that has some relevance to our contributions to the land that we're all standing on thank you martha Bridget, I want to come back to you um, and ask you to read us one of your poems. I know in particular you've written a couple um, about the 
um, area around Plymouth. And I thought maybe, I'm not sure what you were planning to, but I'd love to hear one of those if that was one you were thinking about. And while I'm, before I turn it over to her, if you have any questions for our panelists, please make sure you send them um, to Matt Overing so that he can send them on to me. Bridget, do you have a poem for us? Yes, I do actually. I was just moving them around. Uh, this first one is called Coles Hill. And Coles Hill is the uh, burial spot for the, the Mayflower colonist. And actually it was just below Coles Hill was where we had the gathering. But as I say, it's historically it's the burial uh, place for the uh, uh, colonist. Coles Hill, under our feet, bones under soil, first light still touches faces of the people who gathered here long before, long since the wind crippled boat wedged between sand ribs and its people waded into the shallows, knelt down on the earth and claimed it home. Boat wedged between sand ribs, wind crippled, long before, long since grieving here, faces of the people, still touched by first light, bones under soil, under our feet. And I do have another one if, if you're interested in that. I think we have time for maybe, what, is it too long? No, it's not. It's Go just the same, same amount of time. And this one is more recent. Um, I was doing some research, well, I'd known this before, but I was trying to do some historical or genealogical research. And I knew the names of the, the uh, native people that greeted the pilgrims when they first got there. And when I was doing research, when I lived in New England, I, found, I came across the name uh, Samoset. And I thought, well, that's interesting because it sounded familiar. Well, Samoset was one of the four who recognized, the, the greeted the, uh, for the first pilgrims there. And he spoke English, but he was not Wampanoag. He was actually a, what was a, I've seen two different references. One said Wabanaki and one's Abenaki, but at any rate, he was from the north of, of uh, probably either Maine or Vermont. So this one is called Bracelet Ring Knife. And it was written this, uh, this year, which actually, I'm sure you know this, this is the 400th anniversary of Plymouth settlement. Bracelet Ring Knife, Squanto, Wamsutta, Massasoit, Samoset. Each passed from our eyes, our named ones, but what of the unnamed others? Their sounded names, wind lost, sand scribed, etched into chalk white bark, sun leafed and unwavering. Here then, the strangers, their absurd hats, rough mouths, sodden boots stumbling over shore grass, drooping, exhausted, stunned. There, then, one of mine bartered words with them, open-handed as was right, fed with them, was gifted in return with bracelet, ring, a knife, brittle rust scabbed, color of old blood, it lay beside his baffled eye sockets, empty as their papered words, spelling, retelling in their misshapen letters of names, stories past. But what of ours, each whose past? Whose past do you think they say? That was... Thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you. I, one of the things that strikes me um, in both of your poems, and really in the way we've talked about everything tonight, is the materiality, the, the physicality um, of both of those poems and the, the way that they're remembering and, and kind of honoring um, 
the pe people in the past um, by remembering their their bodies and, and the things that they did. And I think Thanksgiving um, does that a little bit naturally. It's, a, it's about eating and it's about spending time with people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you all are reminding us that um, Native American ways of knowing and understanding also emphasize um, materiality and corporeal corporeality in a way that's really important. I'm sorry, Karen, that was a terrible word to make you sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a, just a little bit of time. We're, we're going to go a little bit over so that we can have a few minutes of question and answer. Um, and the first question that we have is, I think should hopefully be a pretty quick one. It's for Fred. Fred, where can we hear more of your music? Oh. Uh. I'm I'm on Facebook. If you type in my name, Fred Teams, uh, uh, and then if you go to YouTube and type in my name, you can see videos that I, I perform and uh, uh, and uh, I did do a segment on my flute on KET segment. If you want to look at that video in uh, Kentucky Life, um, but other than that, it's mostly on YouTube. So. I will be looking it up. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then a question for everybody um, that I think is a, a really, it's one I'd love to hear you guys talk about a little bit. Um, how do you celebrate or recognize or do you celebrate or recognize Thanksgiving? Hmm. Yeah, well, I do. We, uh, uh, we celebrate turkey and uh, since we live here in Kentucky and I actually do all the cooking and uh, I should do my mom's recipe and uh, the turkey is always moist, soft. <laughs> and actually have uh, fry bread and tortillas and we kind of throw the, you know, the, the native food in there. Yeah, so that, that's how we celebrate ours. So. And uh, before we, uh, we say our prayers and uh, give thanks for everybody and uh, that, that's how we do ours. So. Thanks Fred. Helen? Until this year, we would celebrate with having a family who were close enough to uh, come together. And we would generally say, uh, go around the table with what each of us are thankful for. And uh, I was the one generally doing the majority of the cooking. And I would cook what my mother did uh, so that uh, it was traditional in that respect and her cooking I think ended up uh, being part southern part American Indian which I didn't know until I visited Navajo country but uh, this year it's just going to be my husband and me because uh, this virus is um, interfering with a lot of our traditions. Yeah. Martha and Bridget? Yes. Um... Well, we eat turkey all year round. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, but what we do, I guess, you know, with the holidays, the way that way that we've always done it was, you know, my mom has always seen it, you know, as a day off work. And in any time that we had, you know, and then also growing up with my grandparents, um, when we were home, that was always an excuse for the family to come together. Any time off the coal mines, was a time that everyone would just drive across the mountain and we'd get together and everyone would bring something. And then, you know, in our grace, we, we always uh, take a moment and to acknowledge our Eastern Woodlands uh, relatives, you know, and, um, and that story. But we would always uh, just, you know, it's very similar to Helen, I guess, with being Kentucky people we'd go around the table and all, all us kids would you know, say what we were thankful for. And then, you know, as kids would come up with like the shortest verse in the Bible so we could go and eat first. So we'd say, Jesus wept, let's eat, you know, so. <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, it was just a, always an opportunity for the family to get together and, and, and be together and have food no matter what, whether it was birthdays, holidays, uh, you know, it, it was always the, the same thing, but in partic this particular one was acknowledging our, our relatives up north who um, whose ancestors suffered during this time. Bridget? Well, if I can tell you real briefly, my um, I, it's very low-keyed for me for the most part. Um, 
but I, I do tend to remember one of the most memorable Thanksgivings I have ever had. Again, it ties in with the day of mourning. Um, I went down to Plymouth for the, for the day and I had invited just a few friends over to my house at, that afternoon. I had, I was planning on four people. I think we had a small turkey and just, you know, enough for four people, but not much. And while we were at the, the gathering, I was speaking to some people that I was working with um, some some issues in Canada. And it, they said, well, could we bring some friends? We have some people here from Canada who are, are down. It was, a, it was a, a protest against the James Bay, which is another whole story. But they, I said, oh, sure, that would be fine. And so we left the, the gathering and I was driving, as I say, it was about 20 miles, 30 miles north of um, Plymouth. And I looked in the rear view mirror and I had like five cars behind me. And I thought, this is odd because they were all following exactly where, and turned off where I was. So briefly, when I got back to the house, I had ended up with about 12 people there. And I had planned, as I said, for four, but it, it was just one of the best Thanksgivings I've ever had. I didn't even know these people. They were friends of friends. And the group, there was uh, four of them that didn't even speak English. They spoke Cree. They, and that's also my grandmother's uh, heritage is Cree and Abenaki. So I felt like this is my chance to share with, with distant relatives. As I said, we, we had like 12 people and somehow I've always said it was like the, the loaves and fishes. We had enough food for everybody. I don't know how we did it. We were pulling up ottomans and boxes for people to sit at the table, but it was just my favorite Thanksgiving was be able to share with people that I didn't know the, the food that we had. And that was the important thing. It didn't matter if we had enough food. We did have enough, but it was it was just a wonderful experience. I've always treasured that memory. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. We need to kind of wrap up this portion so that we can hear um, the wonderful music from Martha. So I'm going to turn it back over. I'm going to say thank you one more time. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Tara. And thank you, everyone. What, what an incredible program featuring Kentucky artists and Kentucky thought leaders, whether they're on uh, in, within the state right now proper or their heart is with us all the way from, from Brooklyn. <laughs> so we are very uh, grateful um, for you, Helen, Bridget, Martha, Tara, and Fred. It is an honor to have you share your stories with our community. Uh, before we head into the encore featuring Martha Redbone, I want to again thank our partners, the Kentucky Arts Council and the Kentucky Native American Heritage Com uh, Commission, including Tressa Brown, Mark Brown, Emily Moses, Chris Cathers, for all of your assistance. I also want to thank Nikki Kincaid and the Art Center of the Bluegrass for being a partner of this program and presenting the Native Reflections Visual Art by American Indian Artists of Kentucky exhibition this month. I encourage everyone to visit the Art Center of the Bluegrass safely, in person or virtually, and see this very fine exhibition of Native American works from our Commonwealth. Uh, it's including artwork by Bridget Truex. So we've heard Bridget's poetry, but we can see a couple of her pieces and um, art and music by Fred Nez Keems, who both obviously were here with us tonight. We will not have a December Culture Plus program. However, we will resume on January 21st, 2021 with Culture Plus Comfort, which will examine how people find comfort in times of need, like now, and how communities like ours help those who are not always able to help themselves. So more information on this program will be sent out soon. Again, thank you for attending this program and have a safe and happy grat gratitude-filled Thanksgiving. And now I'm very pleased to welcome back to the Norton Center, vocalist, songwriter, educator, composer, and thought leader, Martha Redbone. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to keep it very simple and short because 
I have a uh, Zoom ADHD myself. <laughs> I can only sit still for a certain period of time. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to meet all of you, to meet the panelists, and to hear um, such beautiful poetry and your beautiful flute playing, Fred. It's just really fantastic. And I, I'm so sad that our Zoom things can't be where we could sing and play together because it would be a dream to have yes. you playing yeah. um, with me. So um, what I'm going to do is in honor of Kentucky, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I wrote this um, play with my husband. It's, it's really a concert and um, where we talk about our land and we call it Bone Hill because that's where our bones are. You know, our, all our bones are in those hills. And so, um, so I wanted just to sing a little bit of that. That th this is pretty much the story of um, the Trail of Tears and returning from the Trail of Tears. So how uh, Indian remo removal to the new territory, as they called it, and then uh, the journey coming back. And so the song is called Forty Wheels because in each of our generations, um, those forty wheels uh, still come back to haunt us. You know, and so it comes back to haunt me and my generation now. So, um, so I'll sing that with you for, for you. In a peaceful little world of Appalachia, way up high, high up on the hills above the clouds. My people dwell. How sweet the silence in the still of our hollows. We hear the calling of our Lord. Black coal, coal is running through my veins. Bloody Harlem. Kentucky, forty wheels up high on a mountainside, covered wagons coming in, my people ride, walking, 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 walking. It was way up high, my great mama cried When the cavalry took a thousand lives Walking, 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 walking Way I hey ya, way I hey ya, way I hey ya Way I hey ya, way I hey ya, way I hey ya. Forty wheels up high on a mountainside. It was the coal trucks loading up a thousand miners walking and walking, walking, walking. Way I hey ya, 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 way I hey ya. Walking, 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 walking. <laughs> and um, also, thank you, thank you. Uh, also, um, when I think about Thanksgiving and when I think about our journey, um, you know, as our East Coast <laughs> um, peoples, I think of you know the when I talk about our our kind of reclamation of of our culture um, that was taken away from us. And one of the things that uh, inspires me is 
the um, for me is practicing the act of having compassion for all humankind and for each other and for all creation. And um, so, you know, I, as I said before, I was raised by my grandparents and my grandparents, you know, I was taught that all living things, all of creation is equal. And, um, and that's very different from what Christianity teaches us. So um, with, for, for me, the creation, all creation is equal. So we are no different from, from animals, from the trees, from the land. And, you know, as my grandpa would say, and us two leggeds, you know, and the responsibility of, the, of us as two leggeds, we're the two leggeds, it's our responsibility to take care of all of the rest of nature so that it takes care of us. So we plant the trees, we make, plant the vegetables, we look after the, the animals, we take care, of, we, you know, we clean the land, we take care of it so that it takes care of us. But Christianity teaches us something different. When Christianity teaches us that humans have dominion over other creation. And our responsibility as humans is to take care of the other living things that we have dominion over, meaning that we kind of dominate. And so um, it's a different thing. So when, you know, our families have been taught in the East Coast, you know, Christianity, that kind of paradox in its way um, confuses how we were naturally been raised to, to treat each other and to treat our land. And so, um, I, mean, I apologize if you hear my pian uh, piano upstairs in the background. That's our son oh. practicing. He's doing his lessons. So. Oh, okay. um, but um, so in that um, teachings that I had as a kid, it's taught me to have compassion for the rest of the world because there's so many things that have been confused and given to us and taken away and that we're all trying to make sense out of. And so for me, having that compassion and practicing the act of compassion helps us to better understand each other and to treat each other better. And so um, with that, I wanted to uh, sing to you a, a poem about having compassion for each other in the world called On Another Sorrow. And the idea is, you know, knowing that someone else is suffering um, and as um, your fellow brothers and sisters to have a sense of responsibility to be able to lend a helping hand in some way, shape or form. So that's kind of the idea and the thought and the thought of um, someone suffering and no one doing anything about it. It's like how, how I hope that never ever happens. So that's what the poem is about. And this is a poem uh, by William Blake, who's a great British poet of the enlightenment era. And he, um, so we turned it into, uh, we set it to some music. And so I have the sound of Appalachia in it. So I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for kind relief? Can I see a falling tear and not feel my sorrow share? Can a father see his child weep nor be with sorrow filled? Can a mother sit and hear an infant groan, an infant fear? Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. And can he who smiles on all hear the wren of sorrow small? Hear the songbird's grief and care, hear the woes that infants bear. And not sit beside the nest pouring pity in their breast. And not sit the cradle near weeping tear on infant's tea. And not sit both night and day wiping all our tears away oh no 
never can it be, never, never can it be. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Oh, he doth give his joy to all, he becomes an infant small. He becomes a man of woe, he doth feel the sorrow too. Think not thou canst sigh a sigh, and thy maker is not by. Think not thou canst weep a tear, and thy maker is not near. Oh, he gives to us his joy, that our grief he may destroy. Till our grief is fled and gone, he doth sit by us and more. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Oh no, never can it be, never, never can it be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll keep it short. I know I'm, I know I'm a native and black, double lung winded, so I'll keep it short. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, and I, I hope everyone has just a terrific uh, and safe <laughs> next few weeks over the holidays and. Um, there's a lot to be grateful for amidst times like this, and I hope that you all uh, can find that gratitude and find some peace and, and compassion, as Martha just said. So with that, uh, again, Martha, thank you very much. And Tara, Fred, Helen, Bridget, we really appreciate your being here, and we are, are very honored to have you part of this program. Have a good night.